you very much for the nice introduction and also thank you very much to, to you and uh, Suresh and uh, for the invitation here. It's my, my pleasure and honor to um, give this presentation here, which is uh, like I've seen uh, coming back a little bit to earlier in relations to earlier presentation and it's a talk about networks of networks because what I'd like to do is to talk about uh, relations and interactions between natural rivers and especially river networks and urban systems, including wastewater treatment plants and uh, stormwater, um, system, stormwater drainage systems that you have, you have heard a lot about these uh, today. I will take an ecological or a receiving water perspective and, and will ask um, from, from the river's perspective what are relevant connections probably and what does this mean uh, in, with regard to, to ecological uh, properties, ecological functions, and uh, um, not to forget uh, management implications. I will take this figure to talk about rationals. Why are we doing and why are we looking um, uh, on these uh, interlinkages, on these networks of networks um, uh, from a kind of normative uh, perspective? Why do we limit urban emissions and why uh, are um, um, and which kinds of, of measures do we take if we want to understand um, the extent and the relevance of anthropogenic impact versus natural dynamics on the status and functions of aquatic ecosystems. And let, let me take um, the EU legislation as an example, which is um, a framework that we have that tries to, to set up um, a gradient, this is a gradient of pollution, you can say, or of ecological alteration, which typically, like many others in the United States, in Australia, or other countries uh, of the world, is um, defining some classes, so some normative sites, which um, basically uh, rank a kind of um, deviation from a situation of a given um, aquatic ecosystem which is, uh, has no or a minimal, minimum anthropogenic impact and typically um, like um, in, in Europe we want to achieve a state in order to sustain biodiversity but also ecosystem services, uh, other things in a condition which has only slight deviations from this what we understand and could parameterize um, as, a, as a natural system. There are important implications, so this is typically the target, so it's not the pristine world, but it's a world with some anthropogenic forcings. And um, uh, on top of that, uh, typically we don't want uh, the receiving waters uh, to further deteriorate, so it's also important to understand how in a future perspective, under changing anthropogenic forcings, and we have seen many historical examples, but um, uh, we have also seen examples about uh, climate change, future land use changes, increasing of agriculture, all these things, including urban, oops, urban developments, all these should uh, develop in a way that a given status that we have at the moment may not um, change significantly in the future. And on the other hand, if we are in a state today, which is a state which is less than a good one, it calls for restoration and therefore for targeted uh, measures uh, to change those environmental conditions in our receiving waters um, that then um, uh, are changed in a way that a better ecological functioning um, can be achieved. So this is a normative background uh, between and behind also um, the relations that I'm going to talk about. Why is this an issue? This map shows you for Germany and the figures are not, comp not very different for, for Europe. This shows you the ecological status of today's uh, river net networks uh, in Germany, and you see that here a, a yellow, red, and orange color dominates with regard to ecological status, why it is a little bit better for the uh, chemical status. This shows you that still a majority of, um, of river systems that we have uh, obviously uh, are ecologically um, affected instead of having um, developed networks of uh, urban water management, but also in other sectors. I will go uh, about the reasons uh, for that in detail. So let's talk about um, a river's uh, perspective and how uh, do and what, what can we say about water and metafluxes from urban catchments in a, a given 
uh, environment where we have um, a landscape uh, like this one with some probably more, more pristine areas here, some agricultural areas here, and then the urban environments there. If we look on modern lifestyles, it's very clear, like we have already heard, we have a um, given consumption patterns with regard to drinking water. Sometimes it has been historically higher, as we learned today, when compared of today, but it uh, may also increase in the future. Then we have uh, specific per capita emissions with regard to nutrients. We have a chemical lifestyle using um, a large cocktail of chemicals that we release uh, every day to the wastewater. And of course, um, there's a certain, um, oops, a certain, oops, hmm. there's a certain amount of um, sealed surface uh, per inhabitant that that we have changed with regard to the surface characteristics um, given average European figures. A second aspect is we have multiple entry points of these pollutions in a river network. Typically, our nowadays design criteria work in a way um, that they are only related to the point of the entry, but they don't um, care about um, interlinkages, including um, overlaying effects uh, and, and things like this. So from a, a river's perspective, we have to um, uh, be aware that we have multiple entry points of these pollutions in a river network. And so therefore the river network um, um, play a role. So the challenge is what I think could be a question, can we manage urban sewage systems, which mean both uh, the sewer networks and the wastewater treatment plants behave in a way that there would be no um, urban uh, systems or sewage systems, or they have only an impact which is so minimal that the resilience of the ecological system, system is not affected adversely. So this is a core question, and if this could be answered after these three weeks, I would be happy. <laughs> um, but I come back to that. So let's look at a little bit more detail about networks and uh, from a receiving water perspective again. We have seen other examples. This is showing for Germany. Um, a map which is, I think, very exciting from a hydrologi hydrological perspective because it shows the water balance, uh, the natural water balance in relation to the water consumption. And you see different colors here. And the more yellow and more, more orange the areas get, um, the larger is the discrepancy between the water which is there hydraulically and uh, the, when compared to those which is used. And you see there are larger spots, entire catchments, obviously, where more, more water is used in these areas um, than it is actually generated there. And you see larger red connections here. These are the long distance water supplies that we have in Germany from reservoirs into big cities and so on. So these are long distance water supplies and you can imagine that these also regionally affect the hydrology of the um, receiving water systems because um, they end up as dry weather flow via the wastewater treatment plants in the receiving waters. So there is a hydrological um, effect on that. I will um, go into more detail. So this is one aspect. So if you look on the dimensions of the networks, these again are the figures for Germany. We have some 10,000 wastewater treatment plants. We have some 450 kilometers of sewer network, which uh, is 13, more than 30 times the circumference of Earth. So it's <laughs> really a significant amount of, of pipes which are underground. And um, if you look on the wastewater which is treated, this uh, amounts to one of the larger alpine lakes that we have, um, Lake Chiemsee. Some of you might know that this is five times this volume of a really big, large alpine lakes, which is um, equivalent to the amount of wastewater that we are treating each year with some removal efficiency, but which is not complete. So there is some residual um, um, pollution. The message is these are large volumes of water and uh, the removal efficiency of, of course is not complete. To put this in perspective with the river networks and the river ecology is we have a river network in Germany which is about uh, in length about 170 27,000 uh, square uh, kilometers in length with uh, catchment sizes above these 10 square kilometers. So larger big river network. The different colors show you the different ecological types we have. So these are river systems which, because of their hydrological and morphology, morphological properties, uh, own uh, specific ecological um, communities like fish communities, microinvertebrate communities, and so on, 
uh, descriptions are available, I don't go into details, but there you see with these um, river networks there's a certain ecological characteristic which is associated with these networks. Some relations, if we have the 540,000 kilometers of sewers, we have 127,000 of rivers, which is a um, ratio of 4.4 to 1, so we have more sewers and rivers, and we have roads somewhere in between. So these are the relations between the networks in terms of general dimensions that we have, and I think it's a good argument um, to look on this closer. Let's look upon, upon uh, the design criteria. Peter, uh, Cliffs and, and colleagues have already talked about it. So we have well-developed infrastructures at the moment. As I said, uh, 10,000 uh, wastewater treatment plants are in, uh, in stage and so on. So we will not see these significant developments that we have in the future, but we very much have to cope uh, with the rehabilitation. There are certain uh, general characteristics, which are, for example, minimum dilution capacities that a storm overflow has to have, a minimum storage capacity which amounts to 2.2 uh, 2 to 2.5 millimeters of rainfall. Then we have a certain wastewater load in terms of COD or other parameters which is entering the rivers on an annual basis. And this is linked with a certain number of overflow events which amounts in our cases for to some 40 to 50 events per year. And uh, we have seen of some of the characteristics of single events from Peter, and we have the continuous oops, we have the continuous emissions from the wastewater treatment plants. That means we have a, a more or less time invariant um, uh, emission there, and we have a highly stochastic one here. And these are interlinked because of the flows that limit the functionality, or that they are limited to sustain the functionality of the wastewater treatment plants. So interconnected networks. Um, also between the wastewater treatment plant and the storm waters. I'm not familiar with this. Oops, no, it's the complete wrong direction. Get back. And there's another important aspect, and this is the size of the wastewater treatment plants, and you see we have different size classes, so we have five in Germany, and they have different um, technical um, capacities, but also limiting uh, technical designs with regard to the pollution that they are allowed to discharge to the environment. So it's also a factor of the size and the character of the uh, given sewer system in a, in a network context. So what is the characteristics that we have to, con to talk about from the receiving water impact? So if you have a separate system, which are typically in, in more typical in other countries like Australia, for example, but also in the United States, uh, not in this complete ideal form, uh, very, very common in, in Germany, maybe in some northern parts. So there, uh, the, the important point is the pressure is characteristic in its intermittent character, so it's a mixture of different flow components which end up here in the river, surface flow and then transported, and this creates peak flows, increased frequencies of critical shear stress, sediment and bed load transport, and if we look about uh, combined sewer systems that we have to heard about where the stormwater is mixing with the dry weather flow, we have the same, oh no, we have an, a different um, hydrologic character, and you will see it in a minute, and we have a much more complex, uh, let me say, chemical cocktail which is there, and therefore the, um, um, the substance we have to talk about. Let's talk about water pathways and balances. So if we look on the basic differences between the hydrological pro properties, if we have a rain event, then if we have, um, uh, let me say, a more natural system, the typical pathway is that under these conditions, the evaporation and transpiration is the, the dominating pathway. A certain amount is infiltrating, and a certain amount becomes a surface runoff and then also enters directly up into the river. It's completely different when we look about uh, on, on sealed surfaces. Here, the runoff component um, is much higher because of the physical characteristics of the surfaces. We typically have a very low infiltration and uh, nah, some, some ev evapotranspiration which is left. Coming back to my um, uh, initial phase, if you look at this on a, on a scale, we see um, uh, this map for Germany giving the precipitation and evapotranspiration, so two of these elements of the uh, equation I have shown you, you see a large um, uh, heterogeneity in given catchment, which means um, that it is very, it is obviously a wise decision 
to look not on general figures for, for one region, but to look very much about um, the, the, the relevant hydrological characteristic, including their variability in a given setting. And it's not the same if you look on the different um, um, elements of, of the equation. So the heterogeneity, when it comes here to precipitation and evapotranspiration, um, is different with these two components. So then it, 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 it is very clear if we look at it from a very simple balance equation, um, it could be a meaningful exercise to look if we have an urban area how the flow separation is working. And this is quite simple if we look on the, um, on the, on the very general water balance equation on an, uh, in an equilibrium and we can even do it in a dimensionless way and uh, maybe derive some uh, separation factors um, that characterize these different flow pathways from a hydrological perspective. The interesting point is, if we look at these, and this is an example showing three different uh, types of urban settlements, you see that these uh, different components, uh, they differ between these characters. I don't go into details, but the interesting part is that these are these dashed uh, lines here, these would be the situation if there would be no urban areas. So you can see both elements. You can superimpose, so if you have a high retention, for example, but you can also affect um, a regional hydrological system significantly if you, for example, have a 90% sealed surface and so on. So this would allow to make this linkage, I was asking at the beginning, how much is how, how, mu how much is our potential to mitigate our hydrological alteration towards a, um, a somehow more natural condition. So this is one thing we can do. And the second thing is when it comes to runoff generation and receiving waters, okay, we have heard about these characteristics that uh, network uh, architecture counts, and this is very clear if you look, oops, on two catchments having receiving the same um, uh, precipitation and runoff, uh, they create <laughs> completely different uh, hydrographs. Why uh, is this important? Because at a given hydromorphology, a peak flow like this one would create a completely different shear stress as a result, as a flow force, which is then acting on the, sur on the ground of the surface water when compared um, to this catchment. And this has been measured um, nicely from um, uh, from uh, Swiss colleagues, showing the typical pattern what is happening with the flows in a, in, a, in a quite simple catchment. And you see here a flow graph. These are a few hours. Here are rain events. This is an average event happening 30 times a year. And this is a flow uh, which is caused by the urban area, and this is a natural flow from the upstream catchment. So you see on a given rain event, there's a, a, a very smooth flow reaction because of the retention process in the natural catchment while the urban one acts fast. The important point is, is it exceeds this cool crit, which is um, the critical flow causing bed load transport here in the system. So in a natural system, there would be no one, and in a, in a, from the urban system, there is one even at low events. While if you take a larger event, one times per year, um, with terms to bed load transport, um, these act the same. They exceed the critical sea stress and volume is higher, but the disturbance regime would be the same. So this is a basic characteristic that we have. So this type of having and looking both on the hydrological reaction, but then on the hydraulic reaction is uh, the important one from the ecological perspective. Now I've talked about chemicals. It is very clear that chemicals are um, another thing. We have seen uh, nicely from Peter that um, some behave like ideal traces, conservative ones, other ones like uh, suspended solids uh, are transported in a different way. Now we have a, a really huge cocktail. So this is a chromatogram of uh, wastewater, typically for Germany, what is in there are some, uh, some, some, some compounds. So there are three, 500 compounds that are detectable in a typical uh, uh, wastewater uh, that is entering and uh, receiving water. The big question is um, what, what are the characters of these, um, of these um, um, chemicals? What are their adverse functions maybe they have or impacts they have in the receiving water? And do we have 
surrogates uh, to characterize this chemical pollution because it's very clear we cannot uh, either even monitor, but uh, uh, definitely not um, model all these 3,500 3, uh, components. So um, it's, it's a good idea to, 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 um, to, to reduce and to, uh, to look on, on, on surrogates um, that can be used, which are much, much more functional uh, surrogates of these uh, large cocktails that we have. One point is very clear. If we look at these uh, surrogates, um, then, and this is from our observatory at U of Zetsis, Uppsala. I do not learn it. Um, this is longitudinal profile of a river, some 40 kilometers in length, having two wastewater treatment plants, one here, one there. And these are some of the components. And you see that at base flow, so if you have um, a constant uh, flow, then um, you really get um, profile that perfectly um, uh, fit with, with and could be assessed with VIXI models uh, that show um, the, uh, the dominance for, for those um, effluents or for those uh, contaminations who are typically wastewater based. There are some like these artificial sweeteners, for example, some perfect tracers. There's borate, for example, it's also a perfect tracer for, for, um, for uh, chemical pollution. So these can be taken as such surrogates. But base flow is only one hydrological um, uh, moment in time. So we have, um, we have the, 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 the varying discharges, and then we have um, an, a point source dominated river, we have, and, and we have other models uh, for, for those who are uh, much more uh, dominated by agriculture and groundwater. Then we have this type of, um, of, of relationships, and therefore, we can statistically work with uh, such kind of relations um, to, to understand and to analyze uh, the impact of the, of the wastewaters. From the ecological point, if we talk about this phosphorus, uh, the range of, um, of the favorable conditions is not constant over, over the year, over the whole hydrograph, but um, it's especially um, relevant in the time, for example, the algae, they only can grow if there's light, if the temperature is high enough. So it are only partial series of the concentration, flow concentration curves where this is really uh, ecologically active or biologically active. And this corresponds, um, and this may exceed uh, limiting um, concentrations, but if we think about flows and erosion and the flow control um, of discharge by um, uh, bed load transport or by by high uh, shear stretch, which uh, detach these algae which, have, which they grow, there's a, a co-limitation of flow and um, the nutrients. So in this sense, um, um, maybe um, there we can work with these exceedance, exceedances and also can uh, analyze uh, the, um, the co-control of, of, of nutrients and hydrological conditions in a way. So this is very clear if you look at one point like also Peter did, but what uh, is very clear if you have uh, networks in mind and we have seen the examples how um, urban settlements are uh, scattered around um, and across networks. So the question is, is there a role or is it only a matter of loadings and concentrations which, which, which are somewhere in the system probably at the end point or do uh, the distributions of the networks count? In other, ways, um, in other words, um, is there a network perspective that could um, put us um, a step beyond uh, compared to what we are doing today, uh, limiting uh, single effluents? And I want to expand on this, taking uh, a river network again from uh, Germany, a typical one as an example. Uh, we have other examples. Katja has one on this poster yesterday. Uh, where we have river networks like this one uh, with some characteristics even uh, with regard to stream orders and, um, and uh, stream densities. And what we typically see in this catchment is um, we have some 100 wastewater treatment plants and they have a certain size distribution, which is very characteristic. And you see here is a population, a number of population equivalents which is connected um, to the given wastewater treatment plants. So these are very small ones, only less than 1,000 people are connected. These are medium-sized and they increase, and these are the large 
tertiary treatment plants with high technology with more than 100,000 population equivalents connected. And you see that there's a kind of distribution. So we have a large number of small ones and then a decreasing one and end up with two or three large of wait for treatment plants in this catchment. This is nice because from a uh, load perspective, this is um, meaningful because it's very clear if you uh, uh, look um, how, many, how many people are connected and therefore how much wastewater load is connected, then these only two or three wastewater treatment plants, big ones, they treat the largest amount of wastewater and therefore also create the highest load of the entire catchment while obviously or it seems to be that the smaller ones do not count very much. This is nice and you can say, well, what, what are you talking about? If I look to the entry, at the entry points of these uh, discharges, then it's a little bit different. What you see here is the mean annual base flow at those points where these single stormwater overflows and the wastewater effluents enter the river. And you see that a large majority of the entry points is below 10 liters per um, second and square kilometer, which means uh, this equals five square kilometer. These are the very small streams and creeks that um, have to cope with these emissions. Um, so the high specific loads in terms from a, in an ecological point of view um, uh, could be observed in the small streams, not in the uh, biggest ones. Um, and uh, these are those points for, where we have at the moment the lowest emission standards. So the permitted uh, wastewater discharge is highest. If we make a very rough assessment and want to look at a characteristic impact length, so imagine there's an entry point, there's a pipe ending up in a river, some either stormwater or wastewater treatment is entering the receiving water, then there's a certain transport and a certain uh, natural turnover uh, unless you um, get back to uh, some close position, something which is also termed as being self-purification. And if we do this for the network, then the figure is reverse when compared to the loads. We are talking about concentrations and we are talking about uh, characteristic impact lengths. So the majority of the river network I have talked about, so these, uh, um, this river network, so it's 80%, these are affected by these uh, small treatment plants. So the small treatment plants uh, control the pollution in a connect in a, in, a, in, a, in a network perspective while the big ones control the loads and therefore we have a kind of optimization problem probably which to my knowledge is not systematically analyzed so far and this was a big motivation um, to enter uh, this workshop and to think about these questions um, and then I come to Peter I use this figure Peter already announced it so these nice um, and very exciting reverse behavior of um, the return periods, uh, talking about uh, peak concentrations and the rain intensity. Um, so it's a small and medium sized, uh, not the big ones, like you would first assume the big storm waters, but the medium sized um, and small events which count. And this is true. Uh, no, it's not true, I'll, but we have uh, evidence also, uh, and I will show it from an example, which is a synthetic example, which also could be an example that can be used uh, during this workshop. By the way, this is a German design network, where, which is used um, as an example to, um, to plan and to operate combined sewer systems, which has some characteristics in terms of a medium-sized city with some average precipitation, average sealed surfaces. And this is done what uh, the emission standards do. If we uh, do this, they have to create a certain storage volume to control um, some kind of emissions of the combined sewers, which ends up in some 1,500 cubic meters of artificial storage that have to be created. What we did is we connected a river network. And we added on a wastewater treatment plant with some characteristics, a, a river, B creek, and C stream. This is a surrogate also for stream orders. Let's say this is the first order stream or creek, river, second order, third um, order. And this is what we typically have in 
networks, in, in urban networks, we have some of these overflow devices that end up in small rivers, other ones, including the wastewater treatment plant, in the bigger parts, and other ones there. What does this mean if we look locally on the hydrological effects? So if you make a, a, a water balance for a rainfall with a return period of one year, you see, and you only have to look on these um, factors of X, which are um, an, an exceedance of the potential natural flow that we would have with this return period. So it's simply an addition to the natural uh, flow dynamics, and you can see in some areas it's very, very low, and at this discharge point, for example, another one where we have a large stormwater retention, the frequency is even only one, per, one event per two years, so it's much lower than this one, ecologically maybe not so important, and here you see the really big differences, 100%, 20% here, so it's a factor of five uh, on a local scale um, if you look on the hydrological effects. But this can be used to assess um, this type of um, behavior. When it comes to um, water quality, um, here's a graph that showing again on a, on a stationary balance. So here's a specific runoff between very low rain and runoff intensities until higher ones. This is uh, also a return period between close to zero and once per year. And that is the resulting, in this case, oxygen condition in the receiving water at this entry point. And, you, and this is a critical threshold that we have as a receiving water standard in Germany. You see there's nothing happened about oxygen. Why could this be the case? It's very easy. The, re the physical reaeration of these rivers is so high that um, there is no effect from the loadings that we have. It's completely different when we talk about ammonia or non-ionized ammonia. Um, and there are these visible three spots that show the same behavior that Peter has shown in this graph, where we have the small and medium-sized event that create the exceedances of um, this threshold. And this is a very interesting part because this tells us, ah, probably I should solve the next one is, um, again. So if we have this, what can we do about it? We can then and probably should include interventions. So um, typically, if, if such um, a matter, an exceedance of, of thresholds is observed, one starts to think about uh, what can we do about it um, in either um, improving the oxygen uh, or lowering this, this oxygen signal here, or um, uh, what to do about these peak concentrations that we want to have below these thresholds. And then it's very important, I think, that um, the system itself and its optimization comes into the game because we can, pro can do probably two things. There's a waste for a treatment plant that has a flow restriction of two times the dry weather flow, but typically has um, exceeding um, um, capacities so that we could increase uh, the dry weather flow to the waste for a treatment plant. And in this case, if we only do it slightly, we, uh, um, we solve this problem. So it's an inter interconnection between the stormwater part, the dynamic part, and the constant part. And if we, for example, um, would build here a traditional storage tank, nothing would happen with these peak concentrations. But if we use this uh, as a constructed soil filter, as a constructed vector, then, then we, we can handle this system. So it can also be used in a way that we can talk about um, a much wider variety of measures um, from this network and this interconnection uh, perspective, which I think um, is uh, very uh, challenging and also, I think, innovative. So let me talk about what we could do about this um, on the workshop, and then these are my last uh, probably one or two slides. What I think is uh, really exciting is uh, to talk about network of networks. In this case, what do we do in a catchment perspective with these systems? So I think we have data here, we have concepts here. We then could, could uh, talk about uh, stochastics and frequency distributions of uh, pollution characteristics, pollution graphs probably. Um, Katja has shown some of these uh, empirical data in, in her poster. And we have also some data which uh, uh, are linked with uh, treatment strategies, wastewater treatment uh, strategies that have been implemented at catchment scales. And these four graphs show uh, the evolution, in this case, of uh, phosphorus loadings from a heavy pollution phase uh, to, a, um, to a rehabilitated phase. 
and this for different uh, types of the catchment, so a difference between upstream and more downstream, lower polluted or um, areas with lower urban uh, wastewater load and those with higher ones. So there is some also empirical background that can be used for testing the real world's evidence. And then I think it's um, this interaction, which is in interesting. It's uh, different, these different urban sources, the stochastic and the invariant part, I think is con also conceptually um, a nice point. Then we can talk about uh, different goal functions. I would propose to work on hydrology, hydraulics, and select some water quality components that we can handle easily. I think there are some. And then uh, we could work about and towards frequency distributions uh, that can be used as a, as a nice measure to, to understand the interaction, but also, um, yeah, relevant effects, relevant parameters, systems behavior, and things like this. And we also, and this is what I'd like to see, what, what, what is the min if we have a given um, a co um, pattern of urban settlements in a river, what is the minimum of the river lengths um, under given thresholds. We can talk about different thresholds, but we also can talk about the positions. And I would see, I've never seen an example that is, has tested this. And uh, if this could be uh, a way forward, I would be very happy. Um, and this would be really exciting. And this leads me then to Suresh. This is something we have discussed because this has to do with trajectories. So if we talk about um, uh, a natural state or a least impact state, so this is a gradient of, of human impact. This can be also parameterized for urban areas and we have one which are less polluted, other ones more heavily polluted. Then it's very clear that under examples we have shown, we have seen uh, or we can assess how a degradation happens, but then if we take technical measures or management measures, we can analyze how these um, um, systems um, then um, in which directions they talk. This leads to the questions of trajectories, which I think um, uh, would also be um, very, very innovative and challenging to look at, um, and probably we also uh, could work on the empirical evidence for that. And this is my end. So I come back to my question, can we manage urban sewer systems with river networks behave in a way if the urban visions were not there? If you could solve it, this would be something. Thank you very much.